another announcement that I uh, need to make as well for our ladies a week from Tuesday. It's the next ladies Bible study, and it's one that you don't want to miss. Uh, something that's been a big help to my wife. It's about understanding your husband, and it's looking at men uh, as three different types of men. And uh, so I think it'll be a blessing to you in just how, we, how to be the best a wife and, and meet the needs that are particular to your husband. So come out. That's a week from Tuesday at 7 p.m. and be a part of that on uh, April the 7th. Here again this time of year, this week, we look at the Lord's death, His burial, and His resurrection. And uh, this passage of Scripture was one that stood out to me uh, in thinking about what Christ has done for us. When it comes to knowing others, when it comes to being known, there are some who know us, and there are some who truly know us. There are some who understand or think they understand and try to understand. But then there are those who have sat where we have sat. There are those who have walked where we walk. There are those who really, truly do understand us. You know, it's the same way with God. There are those who know Him, and there are those who really, truly know God. There are those who know about Him, and there are those who walk with Him. In Scripture, we find such a man in Abraham. We find in the book of James that he was called the friend of God. Someone who entered into such a deep relationship. Someone who had an intimate working relationship with God. Abraham was brought to understand God in a way that very few humans have ever understood Him. And in the passage before us, the Lord brings Abraham through His commandment to him to understand something unfathomable. But in Abraham's obedience, he comes to experience something of God that many will never know. The Lord has inspired this passage of Scripture for us. That we too might not only walk where Abraham walked and understand what Abraham went through, but this passage also opens the door to our understanding what the Lord went through that day that Jesus was offered on the cross. That is the magnitude of Mount Moriah. And that is what I would like to draw our attention to this morning. That we might understand our God. That we might know and feel what He felt that day that Jesus Christ was offered so many years ago. Let's ask the Lord's blessing as we enter into this time. We can move on our hearts today. Our Father, we come to You. The work that's impossible for me to do or any of us to do apart from Your divine enabling. So Lord, we ask today that You would open our understanding. Lord, give us a heart that is willing to hear and to do all that You call us to do. Lord, help us today to feel what you felt that day that Christ was sacrificed. Help us today to understand your heart. And Lord, to understand your love for us and giving Christ for us. Oh Lord, we pray that you would do this for your glory and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. As we enter into this passage, there's really three things that stand out to me about that day. Which Abraham took his only son, Isaac... And was willing to offer him as a burnt offering there on Mount Moriah. Three things that stand out to me that give us a glimpse into the heart of God. The first one of those being the feelings of the Father. In this passage in Genesis chapter 22, we know that it all begins with the test. The Bible says it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham where we could say he tested him. And he said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. When it comes to people's understanding about God today, most view God as, as someone who just is a benevolent figure whose main concern is, is to make us feel good about ourselves. I was reading one commentator this week who said most people view God as they would the, the activities coordinator on a cruise ship. He's just there to give us a good time and to make sure everything goes the way we want it to go. And that's how people view God today. But as we look into this passage, we see that our God is much different than that. That our God loves us too much to simply give us what we want. <laughs> that our God loves us so much that He's going to fashion us continually after the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. We find His tests in life are there for our good. The tests of God strengthen us 
and give us an opportunity to display our faith. Notice the command that he gives to Abraham in verse number 2. He says, take now thy son. And notice again his emphasis, because this whole passage parallels what we find in the New Testament. Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. The command of God. The test that is given to Abraham. As I look into this passage, I began to really try to put myself in Abraham's shoes. What must it have been like that night that such a command was given to Abraham? What must have been the thoughts on his heart? What must have been the feelings? How long must that light and that night have been? I can't imagine Abraham would have gotten even a moment of rest. What battles must have been fought in his heart? I imagine in tossing and turning, the command of God running over and over again through his ears, ringing in his ears, Take thy son, Abraham. Take thy only son and give him a sacrifice for me. Unexpected. Unprecedented. Unfathomable. That God would ask Abraham not only to give his son, but that Abraham himself would carry out that very deed. You imagine Abraham's place that night. Did his mind not race back through the years thinking about his son and all that his son had come to be? I've stood before at the bedside of one of my loved ones as they're about to pass away. And I know in my heart that as I stand there and I know they're on the precipice of death, that that's how I act. That's where my mind goes. To think about those times that we spent together, those moments that were so precious to me. Do you not imagine that Abraham would have done the same thing? That he would have looked back to that first day when he held that baby boy in his arms. That night as he laid there, to think of the joy and the excitement. Remember how deeply he longed for that son. And when he finally came, such thrill in his heart. Look back and think of a little chubby boy romping through the family camp, calling out his name. Could he not recall his little boy grabbing hold of his finger for the first time? That time where he took his boy for the first time out on a camping trip. The first time he taught him how to fish or how to hunt, how to shoot that bow and arrow to ride a horse. Did his mind not go back to those events? Isaac had been the one he longed for and waited for. The Bible tells us a hundred years. And his life was well worth the wait because Isaac became everything that a father could ever hope that a son would be. He called him Isaac, which means laughter. Never since the first day that Isaac had come into his life. That's what Abraham's life had been full of. Joyous laughter. Rejoicing over this son that he loved. But as he laid there that night, I imagine as he not only thought of Isaac, he thought again of what he was called to do to make a sacrifice. Could he not picture himself in those countless times where he had been a part of such a sacrifice? Where he'd gone to his own flocks and he'd searched out for the very best, that, 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 that land that was free of blemish, that one that was strong and and healthy, and he picked up that little spotless lamb, and he brought it to the altar as God had commanded. Could he not see himself as he had done over and over again, raising the knife and spilling the lamb's blood there on the altar to fulfill all that God had given as a picture of the lamb that would come one day? As he thought about those deeds of sacrifice, did his mind then not go to his own son Isaac? I wonder, how could I do this thing? How could I offer Him? But at the same time, His heart urged Him back, not only to His Son and to the sacrifice, but to that relationship with God. He knew the Lord. He walked with God. Jehovah was good. He was gracious. He was faithful. Isaac was a gift to him from God. Isaac was the son that God had promised to him. He was a miraculous life. 
His birth wasn't the only thing that God had promised, but God had promised that through His son Isaac, there would come a Messiah one day. God's promise. And so now we find Abraham at a point where there's a great dilemma. Because God seems to contradict Himself in what He's asked Him to do. On the one hand, God has promised that Isaac must live. And now on the other hand, He's commanded that Isaac must die. How could these two things fit together? How is it that, that God could promise to do something so cruel? And yet He knew God to be so gracious. How could God ask him to do something so cold and and be so distant to his son and at the same time he knew that God himself had always been a very present help in trouble? He began to realize that if this loving, gracious God whom he'd walked with asked him to do it, there must be something beyond his understanding. There must be something that he did not know. The question for Abraham that night must have become less about can I do this thing, but more about... Can I trust God? We discover in Hebrews chapter number 11 of our Bibles, what the Bible tells us Abraham believed that God would do. He knew what God had commanded to kill his son, but at the same time he knew what God had promised that his son would live and a Messiah would come through his son. Abraham believed that he would sacrifice his son and that God would raise him from the dead. That night Abraham made a choice. In an act of incredible faith, the Bible tells us in verse number 3, here's the words that we find. Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him of. He saddles that donkey, employs two servants, He looks for the perfect kindling that I picture him early in the morning, even perhaps before the sun is up, walking into that tent where his son Isaac was resting. No doubt with a breaking heart, no doubt with a troubled countenance, he reaches down and touches his son. Wake up. There's something our God has asked us to do. Isaac at this point in his life was most likely a teenager or later in his life. Abraham here will call him a lad in verse number 5. But that word is actually used to describe also men who are of the age of going out to war. I think Abraham probably referred to him as a lad just as my mom still refers to my little sister as her baby. Though she's over 30 years old. But can you imagine Isaac there perhaps wiping the sleep from his eyes and... Asking, looking up at his father, trusting me, what is it that we're going to do? The Lord's called us to go to a land and make a sacrifice. Come, my son. We must be on our way. And so the journey began. The Bible tells us that they journeyed for two full days before the Lord revealed to Abraham what the place was and where he would sacrifice his son. I can't imagine, but that each step of that journey for Abraham must have been a heavy one. Those two days must have gone by so fast. With each passing step, with each passing moment, the killing place was only getting closer. I wonder... In those moments, in those days, was Abraham able to eat? What would your heart have been? Would Abraham be able to converse at all with the son, with with his two servants? What was his relationship like in those days? What was Abraham's heart? Surely the servants and his son must have concluded that he was troubled about something. There was something about his mission that had a dark cloud hanging over him. As students of the New Testament today, we recognize all this occasion, this mission of Abraham, parallels that of God the Father, His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. There are many pictures of Christ throughout the Old Testament, but you will never find a more intimate picture of the Father leading the Son to Calvary than what we find in these pages right before us today. 
Oftentimes we center our focus on the cross of Christ and we think of the Lord Jesus, His willingness to go to the cross for us, an astounding love. But we rarely think of the Father. And at times we may even be tempted to view Him as cold and indifferent to the sufferings of His Son. I don't think anything could be further from the truth. No love that Abraham had for Isaac, no closeness of fellowship that they enjoyed could ever match the love and the fellowship that God the Father had shared with God the Son. Jesus declared, I and the Father are one. And as Abraham called his son to rise up from the Father's house, to walk that rugged terrain all the way to the place of offering, so the Lord, our Father, asked His Son to come and walk the rugged roads of this life, Roads of rejection and poverty all the way to Golgotha. For over 30 years they journeyed these roads together knowing how it must end. Knowing that when they reached the place, the Father would sacrifice the Son. The Bible tells us in verse number 4 that as they journeyed on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place far off. He said unto the young men, Abide here with the ass. I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and will come again to you. There came a time when Abraham and Isaac must leave those who had come with them and go the rest of the way of alone. Nobody else could enter into those moments. Nobody else could be there. No one else would be able to understand. It was something that they alone had to endure. Likewise, as our Savior approached the place where He was offered that night, He said to His disciples, He said, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. There was only so far that His servants could go with Him. The Father and the Son must necessarily have walked the rest of the way alone. No one else could understand. No one else could enter into those sacred moments. It was a time for just the Father and the Son and onward they walked together to the place of sacrifice. Notice verse number 6. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it upon Isaac his son. He took the fire in his hand and a knife and they went both of them together. The picture is too obvious to miss. Just as Abraham laid the wood of the burnt offering on his son Isaac, so 2,000 years thereafter... Though it was the Roman hands that put it there, it was God and His sovereignty which laid the wood of that old rugged cross on the back of His Son and led Him to the place. They came to a place, the Bible tells us, which God had told him of. And Abraham himself built the altar of which they would sacrifice his own son. He bound his son the Bible tells us in verse number 9. He built the altar. He laid the wood in order. He bound his son and laid his son on the altar. Picture in your mind. Abraham coming to that place. Stones scattered about. Beginning that work of placing those stones one upon another. How deep was his agony? How many tears flowed down his cheeks? Imagine him breathing very deeply, agonizing as those stones one after another were placed, creating that altar, and then taking the wood, placing it in order. The Bible says then he bound his son. Can you imagine that moment? Can you think of Abraham taking his son's hands and binding them together and his son's feet as well? Abraham nodded those moments and embraced his son. Can we not picture him reaching down one last time, giving his son a kiss? Sharing with him those words, I love you. What a moment. And at that time, he laid his son there on the altar, 
That moment had arrived. The blade must pierce his heart. The father must turn his back on his precious son and let his life run out. With all the energy that he had left remaining in his weary body, he raised the knife above his head. The Bible tells us in that moment, the angel of the Lord called out of heaven. With a thunderous voice, the earth perhaps shaking, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. The Lord responded, lay not thy hand upon the lad. Neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. What relief must have swept across Abraham's soul. What excitement. How quickly did he loose his son from those, those binding cords. How long did he embrace him. What a moment. Then he looks up. Beyond his son, almost as though he's peering down through the centuries, he sees off in a thicket a ram caught by his horns. God had provided a substitute. As we look into this passage, just as Abraham had erected the altar, so our Heavenly Father, many years before this, had built Calvary's mountain. He was the one who put the stones in place. The very wood that Jesus Christ would be nailed to, the Father had caused to grow up from the ground to, speak for, to spring forth from that seed in the dirt. The Lord had enabled man to cut this thing down. He created it. In those final moments before the Son would be offered when He cried out, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. How do you think the Father's heart must have ached? Abraham received a glimpse into that, as both you and I have in this passage before us today. And yet even as his heart ached, even as the Father's heart broke for the Son, he led him still together to that place of offering, that place of sacrifice. As He had ordained before the foundation of the world, so His Son was bound to that tree, fastened in place by the merciless nails of the Romans. And there in that moment, as Abraham had raised His hands with that knife above His Son, so God the Father raised His hand against His Son, His hand full of the wrath of God for all the sins of mankind throughout all of time. Lift it up. And raised over the heart of Christ. In that time, in that moment, for Isaac, for Isaac, there was found a substitute. But for Christ, there was no substitute. In fact, he was the substitute. Amen. That day the father turned away and dealt that punishing, that trembling, that piercing wrath for sin all upon his son. And as the blood of the spotless Lamb of God soaked into the ground that day, <clears throat> did not all heaven weep? This Father's beloved Son, in whom He was well pleased, but He made Him to be sent for us. Can we see the feelings of the Father? As we come to this passage, there's something more that the Lord points out to us again, and that's the submission of the Son. The word of God tells us in verse number 7 that Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb? 
Where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. There's a phrase that is repeated twice in this passage. I do not want you to miss it this morning. It's the conclusion of verse number 6 as well as the conclusion of verse number 8. Look at the phrase. It's this simple. They went both of them together. All through the journey, no doubt the same question had permeated the mind of Isaac. With all the preparations that his father had made, there was one central ingredient, one obvious fixture that was forgotten. Where was the lamb? Why was it missing? Its absence was all too conspicuous. They traveled for days, and now they approached the place of sacrifice, and there was no sacrifice. So, or was there? The Scripture doesn't make it clear when Isaac knew that he was to be offered. But I believe he was already coming to that conclusion, even as he asked his father this question. Where's the lamb? Father, where's the lamb? It would seem as his father made his reply, I believe that that is when Isaac was then assured. <clears throat> he... But as he looked full into the face of his father, he didn't see a man out of his mind. He didn't see a demeanor full of hate. As he looked into his father's eyes, he saw that mixture of emotion. That undying love. An unfathomable pain. I'm inclined to believe that Isaac could see that though he must suffer, his suffering was nothing to be compared with what his father was already going through. But his father's words to him were full of faith. God will provide himself a lamb. Isaac knew that this scene was all at the command of God. He, like his father, would do the Lord's bidding. A contemporary of his day was Job. And with Job, Isaac could say at this moment, though he slay me. Yet will I trust him. And so, they went both of them together. Isaac wasn't drag kicking and screaming. He wasn't reluctant or rebellious. He'd known his father's love. And he felt his father's joy in him. And he was again witnessing his father's faith. He could trust him. And he would submit. Likewise, we find on the road that killing place in Jerusalem, we find a son who went not grudgingly, one who went not reluctantly, but one who laid down his life willingly. Jesus' words in John 10, verses 17 and 18, Therefore he said, Doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Oh, how Abraham loved his son, how his heart rejoiced to have a son who would obey him and submit to him, even to such an extent as this. Likewise, the heavenly Father cried for his son, who was willing to go to the cross. As Abraham put the stones of the altar in place, did not Isaac help him? Did he not help to erect that altar? Did he not help to put the wood in order? His father, 115 something, 130 years old in this incident. Isaac could have long time ago run away. But can you not see him just presenting his hands? To be tied. Though they did not need to be tied. Because he was willing. Can you not see him in those moments. As he looked down the, his father's face. And saw those tears streaming. He 
did not see his father's love. As he watched his father as the time had come, his eyes turned to the night. The instrument would be plunged deep into his heart. I picture Isaac again looking into the face of his father. Knowing his undying love. Watching his father take that deep breath to brace himself for the grisly task. Knife raised over his heart. Again, this whole scene gives us a glimpse of that special union of the Heavenly Father and His Son. No man has seen the Father at any time save Jesus. As Jesus sweat those great drops of blood in the garden, preparing himself for the sacrifice, he shared those moments with his father. Think not that his father was cold or indifferent. The son was loved perfectly by the father. And as much as Jesus suffered in becoming sin for us, the father suffered, pouring out that cup of wrath. But in this passage, we see this great central truth as well. God's precious provision. Again, the word of God tells us in Abraham's prophecy in verse number 8. My son, God will provide himself a lamb. Again, in verse number 13, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and he took that ram and he offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. As he readied that knife and all of his body reached heavenward so that he might plunge that knife into the heart of his son, the Lord stopped him. He testified to his incredible supreme love for God. His love for God, his faith in God were proven to be unsurpassed. But there was yet one more lesson for Abraham to learn. God would spare Isaac by the blood of a sacrifice, a substitute. Bless the Lord for divine intervention. The wrath of God is what I deserve. Just as Abraham brought that knife above Isaac, if it were not for the grace of God, destruction would be all that I would taste. But oh, what a roller coaster of emotions. From the depths of despair to the heights of joy, the Lord saying to Abraham, Lay not thy hand upon thy lad, don't do anything unto him. The knife could be placed back in the sheath. The gloom was replaced by hope, fear by the thrill of life, uncertainty by comfort. How quickly did Abraham pull his son back up off the altar? How long did the two of them embrace? How, how many times did they jump up and down as they went around that altar praising God? I can't help but think that those two servants that were left behind down the mountain couldn't help but hear them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. But God wasn't done yet. They come to understand the heart of the father and the son. But they still need to learn the lesson of the substitute. Again, the word of God tells us that Abraham saw that ram. And he brought it and offered it in the stead of his son. In place of his son. Imagine Abraham and Isaac coming to that ram. Imagine them looking upon it. Think perhaps of Isaac taking that ram into his arms. How would he feel about it? That ram so perfect, so strong in his stature, without blemish, completely pure. Imagine Abraham and Isaac just taking a moment, maybe stroking it's wool. Rejoicing that a substitute had been found that would give its life for them. Hope that one day God Himself would provide a spotless lamb that could take every sin away. I don't know what all must have gone through their minds. I don't know every thought that they must have had. 
But certainly this one thought must have been on Isaac's heart. The spotless lamb took my place. Down through the centuries from this experience at Mount Moriah, the scripture takes us to the banks of the Jordan River. There the prophet of God, John the Baptist, preached baptism and repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ, preparing His coming. And there the Holy Spirit confirmed it in His heart as Jesus of Nazareth approached, as He called everyone's attention to Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. For those still today who seek for a substitute, for one to take their place beneath the wrath of Almighty God, there is a Lamb whose blood can cleanse from every stain. There is a substitute. This provision of God, what He provides freely, it's an exclusive provision. There is nothing else that can satisfy the demands of a holy God against the sins of mankind. It's an exclusive provision. Jesus alone is the way to the Father. He Himself declared, no man comes to the Father but by Me. Think not that you can work your way to God. Think not that baptism will take you there. Think not that being a member of this church or any church can do it. There's one way. Jesus. The provision is exclusive. The provision is expensive. You aren't redeemed with, with corruptible things like silver and gold, the Bible says, but with precious blood. The blood of the only begotten Son of God. This provision is examining. Have you received it? Have you received what Christ has done? His blood is sufficient to take away the sins of the whole world. But too many count His sacrifice as nothing. Too many think that they can add to what He has done. Too many think that they're good enough. The Bible asks, how much sore punishment shall He be thought worthy? When He gave and spared not His own Son for us. Why would we turn to anything else? Why would we not come and embrace the Lamb of God and cry out to Him in faith, Be my substitute. Cleanse my sin. Grant me forgiveness. Bring me into your family. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have Everlasting life. Amen. That's the testimony for today. God's love is not found in Him overlooking sin. No, His holiness forbids that. And His love is much deeper than that. His love is much broader than that. His love goes much further than that. His love would not overlook sin. His love would pay the price for sin Himself. Amen. That's the love of God. Today, sometimes people wonder, does God love me? Does He really care about me? Can He see what I'm going through today? Why do I have these struggles? Why is life full of so many valleys? I want us to today consider the cross. Does He love you? Does he care? Listen to the words again. The Bible says he spared not his own son. Substituting him in your stead. Of course he loves you. He cares more deeply about you than words could ever express. Nothing could ever take away that fact. You are loved by God. Amen. It was settled at the cross. No matter what you endure, God loves you. And all he's going to sing a song by that very title. I want you to listen to the words. It's been 
settle the cross.
how then shall we live? How then shall we serve? If he freely gave himself for us, enduring even the death of the cross, why is it that we hold back? Why is it that we sometimes question God's goodness? Never let yourself think for a moment that God's way is hard, that His will is harsh, that His commandments are grievous. As Jesus said, His yoke is easy and His burden is light. Embrace the Lamb of God, Christian. This Lamb of God that was slain for us, hasten to do His will. Be like faithful Abraham and be ready to obey. Though He asks of you those things most dear. I hope today you've come to get just a little glimpse into the heart of God. I challenge you this week to just revisit these thoughts and to know His love for you. Because for us to love Him, it's only possible as we understand His love for us. Embrace the Lamb of God. Let's pray. Father, we come to You today. Lord, I don't know who is amongst us today who may not be saved. Lord, who has never had a time in their life where they have received what You have done. Father, I pray that today they would feel Your drawing them to Yourself. Lord, even now, speak to their heart. Lord, grant a willingness to trust Christ fully. Lord, as your people today, the ones who have felt that love, who have known Jesus, Lord, help us to give back to the cross. Call us to live our lives as a living sacrifice. And all that you've given to us, Father, Help us to return ourselves to you. Father, I pray your blessing in this invitation. Have your will and way in it, we pray in Jesus' name. Just with your heads bowed, your eyes closed for a moment, just two questions.